Well, hey, good morning and welcome to Finland Mennonite on YouTube. Glad you could join us again. We are continuing in this sermon series that we've titled Generation Now, this time where we look at all the current living generations and we see the pivotal role that they all play together in the here and now, right now. God wants to do something with you, regardless of what generation you belong to. Uh, God has big plans for you. We've been seeing this as we've looked at how he's used uh, Gen Z aged kids throughout the year, that would be your 11 and unders, how he used, uh, oh, sorry, Gen Alphas, that's 11 and under, Gen Z, which would be your 12 to kind of 26 year olds. And today we're going to see how God has used uh, people uh, that would be with the millennial age group. Um, before we get there, right, last week we covered Gen Z, right, the tweens, teens, and early 20s among us. And what we saw, biblically speaking, was that this age group has been used and is being used um, by God in amazing ways. We saw how from cover to cover of scripture, right, uh, God is, is using people from these age groups to be eternity impacting world changers. At a time when culture tells these individuals at this age group to just live it up and take these years and, and you do you and, and have fun and just push off any kind of adulting, right? That word adulting. Um, God says, no, no, surrender these years to me, live for me, and you can make impact that lasts forever. Pretty powerful stuff. So check that out if you missed it. Dive into the Word of God. See how He uses tweens, teens, and early 20s uh, throughout history for amazing, amazing ways. So today, I already said, we're going to focus on this next age group, 27 to 42-year-olds. Possibly the most beloved and adored generation of all time, right? The millennials. Now, I'm kind of kidding with that. You can check out my Facebook page if you want to see raw responses when I simply ask people what's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word millennial, as in millennials, uh, because maybe one of the first words that comes into your mind is millennial falcon. Uh, not what we're talking about. We're talking about this age group called the millennials, Generation Y. These would be individuals born from uh, roughly 1981 to 1995. And at Finland, uh, this is another large group uh, generations that we have. We have about 60 people from this uh, generation that attend at Finland on a regular basis. Um, one of the words, I'll, I'll share this so that you would see if you checked out my Facebook page to see that question. One of the words that uh, you'd see there and probably one that maybe even comes to your mind when you think of what first comes to mind when you think of a millennial is this word entitled. Right? We, are, we are told, and, and for the record, I am a part of the millennial generation, born in 83, so I'm in the early parts of it. Uh, some of us would argue there's a difference between the early millennials and the late millennials, but we'll leave that for another day. And uh, yeah, we were called entitled. This is mostly in the workforce, uh, particularly where it was first noticed, where uh, our generation was the first to really be vocal about not wanting to, quote, pay our dues before we uh, get pay raises or get added vacations or get all these perks that previous generations were uh, kind of content to, to let go for a while. We, we kind of jumped onto the, onto the business scene and said, uh, we expect better pay, we expect better vacation, we expect a lot of things. So we were called entitled uh, because of that. And maybe we are a little entitled. Either way, that's generation Y, the millennials. That's a very quick snapshot. If you want to do your own research on Gen Y, check it out, or come and talk to one of us. Ask us what we think and why, and uh, we could have a really awesome conversation about that. But what I really want to get into this morning, and I'm going to ask you this question, is um, is what does the world say to 30-year-olds? Like, What guidance and advice does the world give to people in their 30s? What kind of mantras does culture want 30-year-olds to live by or, or say is the way to live. So I'll give you the first one. For example, and maybe you can think of some others, write it down, throw it in the chat screen, talk to the person next to you. But like common advice for people in their 30s is uh, to climb the corporate ladder, right? These are the years to really climb the ladder, to work hard and to 
uh, get promoted and to work yourself up uh, as high as you can. These are the years to try to become that VP that you wanted to be, right? Your 30s is a way where you're going to become upward, upwardly mobile, right? That's some language that we hear. So what else maybe does the world say to 30-year-olds? Uh, it might say, hey, these are the years to really build your wealth, right? You got to build your wealth in your 30s. You got to be making it by your 30s if you want to be able to retire, if you want to be able to have multiple houses or multiple cars or or the newest technology or be able to enjoy um, <laughs> avocado toast and those lattes that we love to drink. So climb the ladder, build wealth. Maybe it's focus on family. A lot of people in their 30s, a lot of millennials are uh, having kids. So many of us are having teenagers now. They're, they're teenagers. Um, and it's not just focusing on family, but it's also helping to set them up for success. So what are we doing to uh, make it so that our kids have a better chance of success? Right? These are things that the world would be telling us. And maybe another one that I, I kind of thought of that the world would tell 30-year-olds is, hey, make a name for yourself. Look out for yourself. Um, be sure to promote yourself, right? It's all about uh, these kinds of self-promoting, self-awareness, um, self-centered kind of thoughts, right? But make a name for yourself. So these are kind of the things that came to my mind as I thought, what does the world say? Uh, to people in their 30s. Now here's another question for you. As we think about people in their 30s, we talk about the world says, but can you think of, right off the top of your head, can you think of anybody from Scripture? Uh, anybody from Scripture that's in their 30s? Who from the Bible is in their 30s? Does anyone come to mind? Uh, Again, shout it out, throw it in the chat, talk to the person next to you. Possibly, uh, many of you are immediately thinking, Jesus. Yeah, Jesus is said to be in his 30s when he starts his ministry. He's somewhere about 30, 33 when he is crucified and uh, resurrects. Uh, so Jesus would be 30. Who else from Scripture is in this age range of like, 27 to 42? Well, what about Moses? We, we talked about Moses at a, at a previous point. Um, maybe we'll hook show back up again in a later generation. He really spans a lot of time. You know, when Moses flees Egypt, he's 40 years old. He's right in that millennial range. Uh, King David, we definitely have talked about King David. We just talked about him last week. Pastor Jerry referenced him uh, in Josiah being identified as a son of David. Um, David is 30 when he becomes king. And guess what? The king that he replaces, Saul, guess how old he was when he became a king? Yeah, 30. Um, Joseph. We talk about Joseph as this uh, youngest son who gets thrown into a pit, right? And we talked about him last week because he's in, he would have been in that age group of the tweens and teens. Well, uh, we said he goes on to become second in command to the most powerful person on the face of the planet at that point. That'd be Pharaoh. And uh, guess how old Joseph is when he becomes second in command to Pharaoh? Yeah, he's 30. We see in a, <laughs> we see in a, uh, a pattern here yet. Uh, priests, you can read this in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy, they entered service as priests when they were 30 years old. The prophet Ezekiel, many people believe he was 30 years old when he was called to being a a prophet to the people, right? Ezekiel, the prophet, 30. And then John, John the baptizer, cousin of Jesus, also right around 30 because he's a couple months older than Jesus is. Now, some of these men that I listed, uh, they were rich beyond compare. Some of the men listed had pretty much nothing to their name. And of that list of seven, seven people, there are one groups of people there, uh, but there, of that seven, there's, there's one who uh, would have followed the wisdom of the world for how to live and what to live for. Um, the others, they followed a different path and their impact 
is still being felt thousands of years later. And that one who followed the wisdom of the world, by the way, Saul, he had a pretty positive beginning, but he, his story ends really sad. Right? He has a sad ending because he, he followed the wisdom of the world. Now, the Dig Deeper Guide for this week, uh, it's going to guide you through Matthew 3, and it's going to take a closer look at John, the one we call John the Baptizer. And we're going to actually turn to Matthew 4 this morning, right after that, and we're going to take time to look at Jesus, um, in a part of his life right after where he's baptized, and he hears God saying, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Right, so that's the scene we step up on. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to read verses 1 to 17. Now what's going on here is he just gets baptized. He hears this voice. It says, you're my son, when he, and you I'm well pleased. And then he's driven into the wilderness by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And in the wilderness, he's tempted by Satan. We're going to see. Uh, what can we pick up about these temptations? So as you're listening... Um, to this, as we're reading along in these temptations, uh, what I'd like you to do is just think about what are the what are the main themes? What's going on in these temptations? What is he really being tempted by? And then we're going to have a discussion back and forth as best as we can to talk about this and really kind of figure out what are we to glean from this. Remember, Jesus is about 30 in, in this case. So here's what it says. It says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to a holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give to you, if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then, then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, by the sea, in the territory of Zebulon and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So now here's the first question, and kind of think about this. Write some things down. Talk to the person next to you. What's going on in this first temptation, right? Let's just chat about this a little bit. Like, like what's going on? Well, Satan's talking to him, right? He asks him a question, doesn't he? What was the question that he asks Jesus to start this? Right? He, he says, if... I guess it's not really a question, but it's certainly an accusatory kind of doubting statement, right? If... You are the son of God. He presents this doubt, right? Almost setting Jesus up to prove who he is. Then what does he ask him to do? He asks him to, uh, to turn stones to bread. Now, what's the big deal about that? Like, I don't know about you, but I don't know of any, any, any verse that, that exists anywhere in Scripture where God says, Thou shalt not cause stones to turn into bread, right? So it wouldn't be a direct violation of any kind of commandment, but what's going on? What's the big deal about this thing that, that Satan is asking Jesus to do? Well, here, here's the thing. Where is Jesus, right? He, he tells us this, the Spirit drives him to the, yeah, the wilderness. And uh, who else, think of history, of, of biblical history, who else spent a whole lot of time in the wilderness, 
about 40 years <laughs> in the wilderness would be God's people, right? And, and how were their attitudes? Were they always cheerful? Were they always obedient? Did they always do everything God asked them to do? No, right? They complained. They nagged. They, they kept wanting to go back to Egypt. They kept saying how horrible life was. They kept thinking that God was setting them up to die. Like they were, they were just miserable, right? So now Jesus is kind of reliving that, and, but doing it in the perfect way. So whereas the people of Israel, when they made it into the wilderness, they grumbled, they complained, they argued, they, they, they tried to fight Moses several times. They tried to overthrow him several times, right? So where they failed, now here's Jesus also in the wilderness, also hungry, and Satan is coming up to him, right? He's trying to get him to doubt. He's trying to get him to disbelieve, to complain, to grumble, right? Trying to use his powers to turn stone into bread, to not rely on God's ways, but to utilize his own strengths to make it how he wants it, right? But Jesus, right? Jesus was driven by kingdom ambitions, and so he overcomes this first temptation. So what's the second temptation? That's the first one, right? This desire to try to get him to use his powers to, to do things his ways instead of trusting God's ways. Uh, what's the second temptation? What's going on here? Well, we see this same if statement, right? Did you notice that? Twice. If, right? He failed the first time. Okay, well, if you are the son of God, what's he ask him to do? He says, uh, throw yourself down. Well, throw yourself down from where? Well, from the temple. Pfft. Yeah, just throw yourself down. And he gives a couple verses, right? It's fascinating. Satan quotes scripture to Jesus. He says, no, 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 you'll be fine. Look, we already have these scriptures. We know you'll be fine. So just do it. Um, here's the question. Before we get to, to, to Jesus' answer, how could this have gone? Let's say Jesus would have done it, right? And he would have jumped. Uh, what, what possible outcomes could have, could have happened here? Uh, well... You know, Jesus was human, 100% human, we believe, right? 100% human, 100% God, but 100% human means uh, he likely would have not survived such a such a fall, right? That'd be a huge fall to survive. So he could have died. That, that could have been an outcome. Um, or another outcome would be the angels actually would have caught him. They would have kept him from hurting himself. But what, what would have happened then, right? He's at the temple. Temple constantly has people there probably would have seen a, a Jewish man falling from the top of it. Probably would have noticed that an angel or something happened that caused this man to not go splat. And uh, so if he, the angels wouldn't have done it, then he easily could have died. If they would have done it, then all of a sudden Jesus would have been what? Living for his glory? Living for his name? Living to promote himself? Right? That was the thing that's driven by worldly ambitions, he would have gone that way. Hey, what a great way to get fame. What a great way to establish followers. What a great way to really make a splash on the scene. But he doesn't, right? Because Jesus was driven by kingdom ambitions, and he overcomes this temptation as well. So what's the third temptation that he faces, right? What's going on in this third one? Well, Satan offers him something. What does Satan offer him? Basically the world, right? And everything. Right? The world and all of its glory. Can you just imagine for a moment? I know this is going to be a little hard. Imagine for a moment being offered everything. Right? Just being offered everything. Think of a smaller everything if you want. I, th I think of Alexander the Great, who, by the way, was in his 30s um, as he's conquering the known world and creating this vast empire. Right? But think about Alexander the Great. All that he went through, all the battles he fought, all the... All the things that he did, the, 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 the warriors that he led to establish his kingdom. Imagine, and, and that was something, right? I don't want to take that away from him. I don't necessarily condone it, but I don't want to take that away from him. That was a pretty phenomenal feat that he was able to accomplish, especially in his 30s. He died when he was 32, but right, like how'd that turn out for him? So, but could you imagine being offered everything and being told, you don't even really have to do anything, right? This offer, this offer is, is talk about climbing the corporate ladder. Talk about building wealth. Jesus, I give you all the kingdoms. I give you all their glory. They will all 
be subject to you. Right? Like, he's given him a shortcut to even what Jesus is hoping to establish anyway, right? His kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. But at what cost? And what does he say? If you just worship me. If you worship me, Satan tells, Satan tells Jesus, I'll give you all of this. Here's the thing. Satan still offers that. All the time. And I'm not going to give you the answers to this, but just think, how, how might one do that today to bow to Satan in order to gain some kind of kingdom, in, in order to uh, achieve some kind of a shortcut um, to, to their goals, to their dreams, right? How might we still be tempted by Satan to bow down and worship him? And I, no, I don't think it's that he comes to us and he takes us and says, here's everything I'll give you, right? He, he seems more subtle than that. But just think about that. How might we be guilty of that today? But is Jesus guilty of that? No. Not at all. He's tempted. He sees. He sees it. He knows what he's going to endure in order to, uh, to complete uh, what he longs to do to really establish his kingdom. But he's driven by kingdom ambitions. And so Jesus overcomes this temptation as well. In fact, he turns from all three as we see, right? And in verse 16, he's called a great light. Did you notice that? Uh, the people who are walking in darkness are going to see a great light. That's Jesus. And, uh, and this great light, he begins preaching, right? And, and his message is repent. And repent from what, we ask? Like repent, remember, that means to turn away from, to turn away from. So what are we turning away from? Well, um, it's not only repenting from, it's also what are we to repent to? We turn away from something so that we can turn to something else. And, and Jesus tells us. Um, see, if we, if we get it by looking at his responses back to Satan. Here's what you get if you put all of his responses together. And I added this first part. This is my part about it. He's, he's basically saying it's not about getting the most or making a name or building wealth, right? Returning from those things. Returning from the wisdom of the world, the ways of the world that, that we already said are very clearly being uh, promoted to those in their 30s, probably to all of us, but particularly those in their 30s, right? It's not about getting the most, not about making a name, it's not about building your wealth, but by living by God's word, trusting in God's ways, and worshiping God alone. And, and by the way, this is great guidance for all ages, by the way, not just those of us who are find ourselves as millennials. Um, and and the, the, the word repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's, he's, basically, he's basically saying repent from anything keeping you from these three things, these three ways of being driven by kingdom ambitions, living by God's words, trusting in God's ways, worshiping God alone. Now, this doesn't mean friends, that building wealth is evil. It doesn't mean that climbing the corporate ladder is a sin. What it does mean is that followers of Jesus see those things in a different light. We need to learn to, right? And so here's a question. How am I living by God's word, trusting in God's ways, and worshiping God alone with my wealth? That's a good question. I'm going to say it again. How am I living by God's word, trusting in God's ways, and worshiping God alone with my wealth. Or maybe said differently, how am I leveraging my time, my talents, my resources, my connections, and my wealth for the kingdom of God? See, what if all of this, as all of your resources, what if we see all of our resources for being there to advance Christ and his kingdom instead of yours? What if we started seeing uh, our houses, our paychecks, um, our investments, uh, whatever it is that we have, our time, what if we see them all as actually there to support God's kingdom work instead of establishing our own kingdoms? See, last week, if you remember, I challenged Gen Z 
to utilize their fearlessness for God's kingdom, to bring us along, to use their creativity to join God in work. Well, we don't do this alone. That's why it's called Generation Now. See, that's what they bring to the table. They bring that fearlessness and some creativity. What about if, if some Gen Z started partnering with some millennials? Millennials that have connections, that have avenues to resources, so that when a Gen Z person has a great idea, this, this way to push out into, the, into culture more, to get out uh, and, and meet new people and do new things and, and, and join God in different ways, that they partner with millennials who maybe have access to resources, who maybe have networking opportunities to be able to make things happen, right? This is what happens when our, when our generations work together in Generation Now. But you know, maybe, maybe we need to take a step back for a moment for the second takeaway. See, that was the first takeaway. The, the first takeaway, it was just simply asking, how are we living by God's word, trusting in God's ways and worshiping God alone with our wealth, with our time, with our resources, with our assets, with the things that we have earned and that he has given us. How are we using those for his kingdom? How are we driven by kingdom ambitions in all those areas of life? But here's the second thing, uh, particularly to you millennials, if you're a millennial out there, but this can pertain to everybody, but I'm thinking mostly of the millennials. See, I find people are in their 30s, well, they're busy, uh, particularly <laughs> if they also ha have kids. Um, when we did a faith at home study, we did this survey several years ago with our own people at Finland, and, and what we found was that parents, uh, parents in their 30s were the least likely of all age groups all demographics, and we did this the youth all the way up, uh, people in their 30s who were married and had kids were the least likely to take time weekly to pray and to read their Bibles. They were the least likely. They scored the lowest out of all generations for being in their word and being in prayer on a regular basis. And I know this in my own life. Uh, between summer busyness and prepping for the school year, uh, I'm going to be School year starts next week. On Tuesday, I'll be uh, teaching a 10th grade class uh, for homeschool this year, so I've been doing a lot of prep for that. There's been some things going on with our conference, a lot of extra meetings and, and different things, family life, just the, the busyness of, of ministry, and you put all that together, and all of a sudden, I just felt like I don't have time for anything, and one of those things I didn't have a lot of time for, I, I had a, a big lack of being in God's Word for myself. And I shared with the elders at an elder meeting how, uh, how refreshing it was to crack back open into the book of Matthew and to start reading the book of Matthew and to, to be in God's word again, right? And so my encouragement, my challenge to you millennials, are you living by bread alone, as Jesus said, or by every word that comes from the mouth of God? In other words, are you spending time with Jesus? Are you reading his words. See, it's going to be really hard for us to live out his word if we aren't spending quality time in his word. So how can you make that a priority? It's my question, my challenge, my encouragement to you. How can you make being in God's word a priority? The other generations, you can help us, right? You can ask us. You can have conversations with us. Hey, Chris, what's Jesus been teaching you while you've been in his word? Right? And so then I'm I'm being held accountable. I'm being encouraged. But you can be teaching, you can be sharing with me what he's been teaching you as you've been in his word to to uh, maybe entice me to say, hey, I need to get back into into his word to spend time with him. All right? Spend time praying for us millennials that we would not only be in God's word, but we would be transformed by God's word so that we too could be an active, intentional part of generation now. So here's the bottom line, friends. Uh, we are all driven by kingdom ambitions. The, the question, the decision maybe that you're going to have to make is, are you going to be driven by earthly, temporary kingdoms of this world and their ambitions or by divine, eternal kingdom of heaven and its ambitions? See, Jesus came the one from the kingdom of heaven. He came, he lived the perfect life. He died on a cross and he rose from the grave so that you can be part of something that is bigger than you and will last forever. So why would we live for anything else? Let's pray. 
Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you welcome us into your kingdom, that you allow us to, to join you in your work. And, and, and I just pray that we all would be driven by your kingdom's ambitions, to live by your word, to trust in your ways, and to worship you, God, alone. Give us that strength. Give us that longing. Give us that desire. And may, as we turn to you and to your word, uh, may we just be overwhelmed by your peace, by your grace, by your truth, by your strength, and uh, draw us closer to you. Make us more like you, and uh, just amaze us with the things that you do in us, through us, and around us for your glory, for the good of those around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, I want to thank you for joining this morning, and I invite you to read this with me as a sending for all of us as we go this week. Holy Spirit, Help me to be a ready and active participant of Generation Now. Help me to live by your word, trust in your ways, and worship you alone where I live, work, study, and play. Have a blessed week.